Okay. People are coming in. Okay, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I'm gonna run through some, let's just wait a little bit for everybody to, to get in and then we'll start through the rules. Just because you were allowed to register. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna run through a quick rules of engagement for the attendees. This webinar is being recorded. No one can see you are attending um, unless you would like to ask questions. So if you'd like anonymity during the question and answer session, please tick the box to send anonymously before sending your question. We hope to make this webinar as helpful to you all as possible. So please do ask your questions. Type questions in the question and answer session section. Please direct questions to the panelists only, starting with the name of who you are directing the question to. You may ask the question at any point, but they will, they will all be answered after all of the talks. This webinar is at full capacity. And so if we don't get through your questions in the allocated time, we will answer them by email after the session. Remember that this is our beloved South Africa. So if there is load shedding or dodgy internet connection, please bear with us. We will resume proceeding ASAP. Here's the agenda for tonight. I'm gonna to start with a short introduction. Dr. Antonio Rodriguez from MedFem Fertility Clinic will be talking about general infertility, IVF and ICSI. Kelly Loggenberg from Next Genetics will be talking about the importance of genetic testing. Prashan Maharaj from Advanced Fertility Center will be talking about embryos. We'll have a question and answer session afterwards. This webinar is proudly sponsored by Next Genetics and we'd like to thank our sponsors of National Infertility Awareness Week South Africa for helping us to educate the public about infertility. Your support helps us to break the silence, but it doesn't constitute an endorsement of any product or service offered by FASA, FASA Fertility or any of our speakers. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on our first ever webinar during the inaugural National Infertility Awareness Week. My name is Saski Williams, and I'm the founding director and CEO of FASA which is of course the Infertility Awareness Association of South Africa. And I'm proud to be bringing this week to you in association with the lovely ladies at House of Fertility, Michelle and Lucia. Together we decided that as the UK, Australia, the US, Canada, amongst others, all have a week dedicated to infertility, it was high time that South Africa had one too. 2020 will be remembered for many not so great reasons, but in infertility circles, it will always be known as the year South Africa had its very first dedicated fertility show, Fertility Show Africa, back in March, and its very first National Infertility Awareness Week, meaning that breaking the silence in our beautiful country is gaining momentum, and we promise to keep it going until any stigma attached to it is well and truly gone, and people understand the importance of an early diagnosis and know their options when it comes to their fertility. So let's get started. Our first speaker is Dr. Antonio Rodriguez, Dr. Rodriguez co-developed and is a director of MedFem Fertility Clinic. He's speaking to us tonight on IVF and ICSI. Over to you, Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you very much. So, first of all, uh, really a word of thanks to you ladies for the work that you do. Um, it really is, uh, for me, something that has been very important over all these years, just to see how much effort you put into it. And I think uh, I feel privileged to be starting this uh, week in uh, the National Infertility Awareness Week and really well done to you. So I've been asked to talk about IVF and ICSI. Um, I've decided not to put slides up. But I'm going to just really share with you certain pressure points and certain things that I think are important during an IVF ICSI uh, journey. Obviously, importantly, is if a decision has been made um, along the way that you need IVF or ICSI, and we'll get back to that, which one do you do when, it is highly critical that and important that you make sure that you've been fully investigated. So on the female side, it's, it is important to have had a full hormone profile. It's important to have had the anatomy of the pelvis checked both by ultrasound and either by a hysterosalpingogram or a laparoscopy, hysteroscopy, 
prior to going through an IVF process. Why do I say this? All those little factors, hormonal factors, whether it be your thyroid, your prolactin, your fasting insulin levels, um, they play a critical role in egg quality in the female. So these need to be done, and if they haven't been done for a period of time, they should be repeated. We find that sometimes one is, uh, feels that the, the actual tests are fine if they were done six months ago. It's better to repeat them because people do change and they are critical. All those factors that I mentioned, prolactin, insulin, and thyroid are critical in egg quality and, and uh, how the, not only the ovary works, but how the uterus uh, receptors um, are prepared for embryo transfer. In terms of the male, obviously, a semen analysis is important, and that will determine uh, from the laboratory point of view, it's important because they can then work out what they should be, uh, what they should be doing on the day that they need to prepare the sperm and manage the sperm in the laboratory. In our particular practice, we, uh, it's very important for us to um, also do male hormones. And these hormones that are important on the, on the male side include exactly the same as the female. And while I'm talking about that, just to mention that in terms of the male and female, we have the same hormones. We have FSH, we have insulin, um, we have prolactin, and these all play a very important role in how the sperm behaves. And if those things are out of sync, they need to be managed before you start your IVF process. If we then look at why would you have IVF in the first place, there are very specific indications where there isn't a choice. If you've lost your fallopian tubes or they're damaged due to infection and cannot be repaired, um, you need to go through an IVF process. In terms of uh, the male, it's important that if the count, motility, the count is how many sperm there are, um, so this is count per milliliter. And we take 10 million as being normal. And motility is motility is how the sperm move, the movement of the sperm. If they are less than 30 million, if there is a very low, what we call teratis zoospermia, which in simple terms means a percentage of normal sperms, this may play a role. Having said that, men with very low, uh, morphologies, if their wives have specific problems such as endometriosis or lack of ovulation or some hormonal factors, sometimes if you correct those factors, in fact, the sperm is capable of doing its job. And obviously, if you're going to need to use donor eggs or surrogacy um, or pregenetic screening, then you have no choice but to move to in vitro fertilization. Also, men who have what we call azoospermia or they have a zero sperm count, you sometimes have to go and get sperm from the testes or the collecting dust ducts of the testes and those people need, in fact, those males need ICSI. If we look at what other reasons for IVF, if you've tried artificial inseminations over a period of time and uh, you have not succeeded, then effectively uh, your next step would be IVF. We feel, excuse me, we feel it's important that um, you don't do artificial insemination forever. We, we kind of, in our practice, have a rule, if there's an indication to do it, we do it for three cycles. Um, patients who have resistant polycystic ovaries, where you try everything to try and get them to ovulate and it's impossible, in vitro fertilization plays an important role. And then um, patients who have endometriosis, obviously some of them have such severe endometriosis that you have to go directly to, to IVF and uh, others have failed normal uh, timed ovulations or inseminations and you move to IVF. What patients often ask about, what about age and AMH levels? It's important that as fertility patients, you, you understand and realize that age does play a critical role. It doesn't mean that if you are older, you can't have a baby. What it means is that we as fertility specialists pay a very important, uh, pay an important attention to age. So the older you are, the more aggressive we need to be to get you pregnant. Because as you are getting older, your results are going down dramatically. 
So age plays a role instead of sitting around waiting for a year. And I think this is very important because we do see patients that have seen maybe a general gynecologist, they present to us at 40, 41, and the, the advice was they should, they should try for six months, a year, and then come and see us. I think if you are in the older age group, see your fertility practices. We have excellent fertility practices in South Africa, and you need to see fertility specialists early so that they can determine what the best management for you is. And sometimes that management might be just getting a little thing right, even if you are 41. It might just be fine tuning an ovulation. But if you miss things and, it, and, you, and you spend a year waiting for something to happen, by the time you get to a place like a fertility practice, you're going to, it's going to be too late. In terms of AMH levels, which is anti-malarian hormone, we, a lot of patients read a lot about it. And depending what you read, it can really make you freak out if you have an anti-malarian hormone that's very low. Again, anti-malarian hormone is a measure of how many eggs you have in, in, a, in a broad sense. And what we take is that if you have low anti-malarian hormones, one should be a bit more urgent in trying to help before pregnant. Our particular practice feels strongly that there is no such thing as the anti-malarian hormone is so low that you can't have a baby. They are divorced. Anti-malarian hormone equals reduced egg reserve. There are patients with reduced egg reserve in their 20s, in their 30s. Having said that, if they are ovulating, they can still fall pregnant. There's not a direct correlation with reduced egg reserve or reduced egg numbers and egg quality. Obviously, certain people have poor egg quality. There are some women who can produce 20 or 30 eggs and you won't get one embryo from that person. So across the board, embryos are the, are the outcome of a good egg and a good sperm. And uh, the reason I'm making a, a bit of noise about AMH levels, sometimes people are written off with very low AMH levels. Um, and are encouraged to do donor, donor eggs. And there's definitely nothing wrong with doing donor eggs. But at the end of the day, one needs to focus and see if you can get the physiology right in that patient. And in some of them go towards IVF, such as low dose in vitro fertilization, low dose ICSI. In terms of IVF, it was a broad context. Once you've made this decision to do IVF, what is the actual difference between IVF and ICSI? IVF is where we, and, and both processes are the same in terms of the point until you've got the eggs out. So getting eggs out, the stimulation will be determined by the doctor looking after you. It's very patient specific. How, what is your AMH levels? What is your history? What is, uh, what is your history in terms of what treatments you've had? And then the doctor will choose a very specific stimulation protocol that is related to your particular history and examination. And again, I emphasize this pressure point because a lot of people compare notes with their friends and get upset when um, things are different. Uh, your doctor will be choosing a stimulation protocol that is very specific to you. And dosages vary, and that will be determined uh, by the doctor. Most patients will go on a normal stimulation protocol. We reserve low dose stimulation because a lot of people ask about this. Low dose stimulation is for patients with low egg reserve. I'm of the opinion that if you bombard receptors of the ovary with very high doses of drug, you actually interfere with the quality of that egg or you switch off the stimulation totally. And in that group of patients, we find we do our best with a modified low dose protocol. And in some patients, you have to go to a sink, what we call natural cycle or single leg IVF. And for the right patient, this gives them a baby. Um, and we find that uh, if, if there's a male factor, someone's got very low egg reserve, you often have to resort to a natural cycle IVF. And, and for the right patient, it is a rewarding technique, but might take a bit longer uh, to, to lead to a positive result. In terms of ICSI, there are certain specific male factor problems that you have to do ICSI. If the count is low, if the motility is poor, if you've had to get sperm from the testes either by 
through the epididymis or doing a biopsy. That group of men, uh, their wives are going to need to have ICSI to create an embryo. And ICSI, in simple terms, is intracytoplasmic sperm in injection. And what the embryologists are doing, they're putting one sperm into an egg and they choose that sperm in, in they have certain parameters to choose that sperm. But I must emphasize that an egg, the, the, the chromosomal nature of the egg and the chromosome and the quality of the egg is not something we can predetermine. We can optimize it by good, healthy lifestyles, eating properly, taking the right vitamins, uh, making sure your hormones have been checked and managed properly. We can optimize that egg quality. But if the chromosomal nature of that egg is abnormal, then it'll create an abnormal embryo and you won't fall pregnant. We must emphasize here that the majority of human embryos in people who are trying to fall pregnant in the world are abnormal. What the body does effectively is it discards those embryos. So if we've got a young woman of 25, no fertility problems with two previous children, she doesn't always fall pregnant on the first month. In fact, in that group of patients, it takes three to four months to fall pregnant. And that is not because you haven't had an embryo formed. The embryo is abnormal, the body recognizes it and kicks it out and waits for the next cycle. IVF is much the same. We collect a lot of eggs and that is why we do IVF. We, we, we try and collect a lot of eggs if we can. The eggs are all fertilized, but we don't expect out of 15 eggs to have 15 healthy chromosomally normal embryos. We'll be lucky and happy if we get four to six. Um, and in some patients you might get one and in some you might get all 15. But those are people at the edge of the curve. In terms of why does IVF fail? Because this is asked often. Back to the story, 95% of the time it'll be because that particular group of that embryo or that, those two embryos uh, are abnormal and hopefully you have frozen embryos and those frozen embryos, the fact that the first two didn't work statistically, your chances of getting a good pregnancy in your second transfer is very high. Just briefly, I'd like to just talk about the fact that we, we really do promote single egg in vitro fertilization transfers. The reason we promote this is because patients with twins have a higher risk during that twin pregnancy. There's no rule to it. But in our practice, we don't put back more than two embryos. We feel strongly that uh, even the two embryo high risk twin pregnancies is the most risk we prepare to take. My personal feeling at the moment while we're dealing with COVID is that it's, uh, we are advising our patients that it's better to put one embryo back because your chances of having a term pregnancy with one baby is much higher. And obviously we don't know what's going to be happening in our hospitals in terms of ICUs. Um, and that's our recommendation. Some patients with careful counseling still opt to carry on. I think it's pertinent and prudent for me to briefly talk about um, the COVID situation. A lot of patients are asking about it. Should they carry on treatment? A couple of interesting points. We are seeing an upsurge, well, if especially in the beginning of May and June, in patients in terms of wanting to do fertility treatment. And number two, uh, we are seeing actually an increased pregnancy rate. And I think the lockdown, initial lockdown period was very positive to a lot of our female patients in terms of something that I feel strongly about, and that is stress and how stress plays a role uh, in, in infertility. And um, I, it's quite exciting to see that that change is happening. What does COVID do to the pregnancy? There's, in terms of all the work done in the first trimester, does it cause increased miscarriages? And as you can imagine, quite a lot of pregnancies in the world have taken place now. Um, it, it does not increase miscarriages. Uh, it doesn't seem to cause a problem in the first uh, 12 weeks of pregnancy. There is a slightly increased uh, risk of miscarriages if it's contracted in the last trimester. Uh, uh, sorry, not miscarriages of premature babies, I apologize, of premature babies. Uh, um, and there haven't been a lot of reported cases of what we call vertical transmission, where the, where the uh, baby actually comes out with uh, symptoms and signs suggested that 
they have COVID. In fact, only recently was there was one obvious case. So I think it's very important that from a general point of view, if you watch yourself, I think you need to self-isolate during this pregnancy. You've got to make sure that your, your husband and anyone around you needs to, to isolate themselves as much as possible and follow the rules. If you follow the rules that have been given to us, and we've, we've heard them many times, uh, including mask wearing and being careful, washing your hands, we, you're going to limit the risk. Um, in our particular building, we've got uh, techniques of people coming into the building, we screen them properly. Um, you know, this is a difficult time, but I think we, our patients are asking to have children. We believe that with the right management, we are happy with it. I know that um, in terms of doctors, in terms of the hospitals, uh, they are getting busier. The gynecologists are, are coping well. Um, the patients are happy. Uh, and I think that uh, there's, no, there's no necessity not to carry out uh, in vitro fertilization with the right preventative mitigating um, factors in play. Um, lastly, in terms of pregenetic testing, when is that done? We're going to have a whole talk on it, but from a, from a clinical point of view, we use pregenetic testing for the, for, not as a routine, it's for patients mainly who are at higher, or higher age, older age group, higher risk because they've had recurrent miscarriages, patients who've had abnormal children in terms of NRPT tests where they've had to terminate or they've had recurrent early miscarriages with diagnosed abnormalities, but it's not a routine. I just want to just emphasize on this that very few women, no matter what age group they're in, don't present at 10 weeks with an abnormal NRPT in our particular practice and I believe in all the uh, fertility practices. So it's very low to find someone at 12 weeks with an abnormal baby. So in our pre-genetic screening, we keep for a very specific group of patients. I know I've given you a quick overview and I hope I've managed to mention some of the pressure points, um, but we, we just wanted to give you an overview and, and then as we get along, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions and, and, and give you a chance to be able to interact with the three of us tonight so that you um, are having a, a feedback as if we are uh, sitting in a consultation session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Kind words at the beginning, we do appreciate that. Um, you have got some questions, so what we'll do is we'll go through them at the end after all the talks. Okay, our next speaker is Kelly Loggenberg. There she is. Kelly is a genetic counselor at Next Biosciences. She's going to be talking to you about the importance of genetic testing. She does have a presentation, so she's just going to be sharing her screen with you and setting that up right now. Sorry, give me one second. I am um, just trying to, there we go. Can you see my presentation? Yes, yes we can. Okay, perfect, thank you. Right, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, thank you also for having me, inviting me to come and speak. Um, here we go, let's just get everything ready. Okay, so thank you um, for that introduction. Um, like you said, I'm the genetic counselor at um, Next Genetics. Um, so Next Genetics is part of Next Biosciences, which is a biotechnology company based in Midrand. Um, we focus on reproductive genetic testing um, and offer a number of genetic tests along the reproductive pathway. So many are done in our lab in Midrand and some are done in collaboration with international labs. So what I'm going to be talking about today, um, oh, sorry, I just need to get my presentation to move. So I'm going to be talking about the importance of genetic testing as part of the IVF um, process. So just to give you an idea of the outline of the talk, so the things that I'm going to cover, briefly going to tell you what is a genetic counselor because it's a profession that not many people are familiar with. Um, and then I'll take you through um, the various tests that are available along the reproductive pathway with a focus on pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidies. 
and then I'll cover, cover some FAQs of things that patients ask us um, all the time. Right, so what is a genetic counsellor and what do we do? So we are healthcare professionals with training in genetics and counselling. We aim to help patients make sense of complex genetic information and enable informed decision making in what's often a very overwhelming time for patients. So we work in a variety of areas, um, which include reproductive genetics, cancer genetics, um, pediatric and adult genetics, and we work very closely with the other clinicians that are involved in the care of the patient. So, for example, gynees or your fertility doctor. In a reproductive setting, genetic counselors are often involved in discussing the tests that are available to clarify the risk of a genetic condition, either in a current pregnancy um, or in a future pregnancy, as well as in situations where there may have been a pregnancy loss to try and provide information about the possible causes of that loss. So this slide gives you an overview of the different genetic tests that are offered um, throughout the reproductive pathway. So some tests are done prior to conception when planning a pregnancy, so that would include carrier screening. So this is where some couples may choose to have testing done for some of the most common autosomal recessive conditions where there won't be any known family history of the conditions in the family. Um, and this test can then clarify the risk to a future pregnancy. If we move on to pre-implantation genetic testing, this is testing that's done in addition to IVF prior to the selection of um, an embryo to transfer. So there are two main tests that fall into this category. Um, one which determines if the embryos have the correct number of chromosomes present um, called PGTA, so pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. And that's going to be the focus of this talk. Um, the other pre-implantation genetic testing that is available is when there is a known genetic condition in the family that the couple would like to prevent passing on. So for example, something like cystic fibrosis. Um, then there is also genetic testing that can be done um, following a pregnancy loss. As we know that almost up to about half of preg early pregnancy losses um, can be due to chromosomal abnormalities and having this testing done can provide a lot of important information to couples who have experienced a loss. Um, and then the last test that's on this slide, um, during pregnancy we're able to offer non-invasive prenatal testing, or NIPT for short, um, for the most common chromosomal abnormalities. So all of these tests can be discussed in more detail with your, um, your doctor, your fertility doctor, or a genetic counsellor. And like I mentioned earlier, for the purposes of um, this evening's talk, I'm going to be focusing on PGTA. So what is pre-implantation genetic testing um, for aneuploidy? So it's a genetic test that's performed on a few cells that are removed from an embryo to determine if the embryo has the correct amount or number of chromosomes present. So knowing this information will help your fertility doctor to select an embryo that is most likely to lead to a successful pregnancy. And maybe just to take a step back here um, to explain what chromosomes are. Um, so chromosomes are the structure that carry our inherited material or DNA. Um, typically human cells have a total of 46 chromosomes. They come in pairs that are numbered from one to 22, and the last pair determine um, your gender. You inherit one chromosome of each pair from your mother and one from your father. So women typically have two X chromosomes, and men will typically have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. And when there are problems with this number or an incorrect number of chromosomes present, that can lead to problems with the development of a pregnancy. So we refer to that incorrect number of chromosomes as aneuploidy. So this is when there is an extra or a missing copy of a whole chromosome, or sometimes it can be parts of a chromosome that's extra or missing. So an extra copy of a chromosome is called a trisomy, while a missing copy of a chromosome is called a monosomy. So on this slide, you can see that um, there's an example of three copies of chromosome 21 as opposed to the usual two copies. 
And this leads to a condition which most people are familiar with called Down syndrome. So who is at risk of aneuploidy and why is it important to detect? So we know that aneuploidy or incorrect number of chromosomes can happen in embryos in women of any age. Although we do know that the risk of aneuploidy increases with advancing maternal age. So this risk, it's generally accepted that this age-related risk starts to increase around the age of 35. Um, although we know that, as I said earlier, you can see um, aneuploidy in even women um, younger than 30. It happens at any age, but it does increase as the mother's age increases. So it's important to detect aneuploidy because embryos with the incorrect amount of genetic material may fail to implant. It may result in early pregnancy loss. In some cases, and this is very rare, as Dr. Rodriguez mentioned, but in some cases, um, if there is an incorrect number of chromosomes, that pregnancy may carry to term and it may result in a live birth. However, most cases will have physical intellectual disabilities. Um, so it is important to try and detect these early. Um, so who can benefit from PGTA? So any, any patient undergoing IVF may benefit. Um, your doctor will have a detailed discussion with you about this and whether they feel it is needed given your situation. But generally we see that there is a higher uptake if the female patient is of advanced maternal age. Um, because that's where we do see the risk of chromosome abnormalities increasing. We also know that there is clear benefit for patients who have experienced recurrent pregnancy losses, either natural pregnancy losses or with um, previous IVF cycles. Um, couples who may have experienced repeated implantation failure or couples where there's a previous history of a pregnancy with a chromosome abnormality. Um, and then also couples who are known to be carriers of a sex-linked condition. So there are certain conditions that affect um, genders in different ways, so that affect perhaps males um, more predominantly, while females are carriers of the condition. And by knowing the gender of an embryo, we can clarify the risk to a future pregnancy. So I will mention this later on in the talk, but just to note that sex selection in general is not allowed, is not legal in South Africa. So PGTA cannot be done with the sole reason for determining the gender of the embryo, um, but it is allowed if there is a, a risk of a sex-linked disorder. So what are the potential benefits of PGTA? So there is a higher chance of a successful pregnancy because you are choosing an embryo that has the correct number of chromosomes. Um, it can potentially reduce the risk of miscarriage because, as I mentioned earlier, we know that a large proportion of early pregnancy loss is due to chromosome abnormalities. Um, your fertility doctor may have more confidence in transferring a single embryo as opposed to multiple embryos and the, the potential complexities that go along with that. Um, and Dr. Rodriguez mentioned that in his talk as well. Um, and then it may also reduce the number of IVF cycles needed to, um, to achieve a pregnancy. So just to give you a brief overview of how PGTA works. So first, a couple will have to um, go through an IVF process as outlined by Dr. Rodriguez. Um, once the embryos reach day five or six of development, um, about between five and eight cells are removed um, from the embryo and they're taken from the part of the embryo that will eventually form the placenta. So these cells are then sent to the, um, to the lab for testing while the embryo remains safely at the fertility clinic. So the, the embryo never leaves the fertility clinic. The lab only receives those few cells that were removed. Um, the lab then does the genetic testing to determine the number of chromosomes present in each biopsy sample. Um, and a report will then be sent to your clinician um, that your doctor can use to select an embryo that is most likely to result in a successful pregnancy by choosing an embryo with the correct number of chromosomes. So the results from PGTA testing are grouped broadly into three categories, either euploid, which means correct amount of chromosomes or normal chromosomes. These pregnancies will have a high likelihood of a successful pregnancy and are generally recommended for transfer. 
The second group is um, embryos that have aneuploid um, results, which means abnormal number of chromosomes. So these embryos are unlikely to lead to a successful pregnancy and are not recommended for transfer. And then the third and most complicated group of results is mosaic embryos. Um, so what this means is that that biopsy sample that the lab received, the, the few cells that are, rece are received, there are a mixture of normal um, cells with the correct number of chromosomes, as well as having some cells that have abnormal chromosomes. And this makes it very difficult to know how the embryo will continue to develop with the normal and abnormal cells. There is a small chance of a successful pregnancy. So there are um, some reports of successful pregnancies um, following mosaic embryo transfer. Generally, this is not routinely, these embryos aren't routinely considered for transfer, but in the case of a couple where there are no euploid embryos for transfer, um, depending on the exact chromosomes that are involved um, and what the, what the anomaly is, following a very detailed discussion with the genetic counselor and the fertility doctor, um, it may be considered, but it's not something that's done routinely. And then just to move on to the um, frequently asked questions, so things that come up all the time. The first one is, is it safe for the embryo? Um, so is it safe to remove those few cells? And there are many studies that have shown that removing those cells from the developing embryo doesn't seem to have any impact on the continued development of the embryo. And it doesn't seem to have any adverse effect on the health of babies born following IVF and PGTA. So does it guarantee a healthy baby? And the answer to that is no. Unfortunately, there's no test that can guarantee a healthy pregnancy or a healthy baby. While PGTA can provide a lot of information, it is important to be aware of the limitations of the test. Um, it can't detect single gene disorders, like for example, cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia. So it is important just to know exactly what information the test can provide, how it can benefit, but also what the limitations are. So is gender reported? So gender is reported to the, to the fertility doctor. Um, and this is mainly because um, it's important to know if there are any anomalies detected with the sex chromosomes so that the doctors don't consider those embryos for transfer. Um, but it is important to know, like I said earlier, that sex selection is not legal in South Africa. Um, so this information is not generally reported to the, to the patient. And then we get a lot of questions about being able to determine characteristics like intelligence, eye color, height, um, predisposition. Um, recently, we were asked, will PGTA be able to determine if um, a future child will have a happy or a sad predisposition? So these are not things that we can detect on PGTA. Um, there's currently no testing that can pick up these traits um, routinely. And this is where we then venture into the realm of designer babies, which raises many, many ethical considerations and discussions which are beyond the scope of this talk. Um, but it is important to know what the test can do and what, what it can't do. So in conclusion, by adding um, PGTA to your IVF treatment, the chances of a successful pregnancy may be increased. It is important to discuss the potential benefits and limitations of the test with your fertility doctor and to know that genetic counselors are available, are available to provide information about PGTA and other, other genetic tests if needed, either before a test or post-test to discuss complicated results. Thank you very much for um, your time and listening to the talk and I'm very happy to answer any questions um, at the end of all the presentations. Here we go. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was that was so informative. Really, really enjoyed that. And we have got some questions for you after Perfect. our next speaker. So next up, and our final speaker for tonight is Prashan Maharaj. Prashan is the lab director of Santa Fertility Clinic at Advanced Fertility Center. And he's going to be speaking to you about embryos. He's also got a presentation, so just bear with him while he shares his screen. Oh, there we go. Over to you. 
Kiitos. So hi guys. Um, I'm the lab director and embryologist um, at the um, Santon Fertility Clinic. Um, I have prepped this presentation on embryo development, um, as I know that the lab uh, often is a place of mystery for a lot of people, and that many patients don't get to see what happens behind the scenes. So this is a step-by-step -step account of the events that take place in the lab over the six-day period. Sorry about that. Um, so on the first day actually um, is your egg collection. Um, on the morning of your egg collection, you're gonna arrive at the IVF clinic and be admitted into the ward area and prepared for your trip to the theater. Um, the process of the egg collection involves the drainage of the follicles within the ovary by the fertility specialist. This fluid which is drained is given over to the lab uh, where we use a microscope to identify the eggs. The eggs are then picked up and washed and placed in an incubator in a culture media, which is designed to give them the nutrients they need until we are ready for the insemination process. Once your eggs have been collected, we will, we will prepare the sperm sample, either from your partner or if you have chosen a sperm donor. This will be used for the insemination later that day. After all of this is done, um, a member of our lab team will come and see you, confirm with you the number of eggs we have collected and the quality of the sperm sample and the insemination method we intend to use, uh, whether it's IVF or ICSI. Under the microscope, this is what an oocyte actually looks like um, at the time of egg collection. So the dark center is the actual eggs surrounded by the cloudy-like cells known as the cumulus. After the egg collection, the next step is the insemination process. If you are using conventional IVF, the prepared sperm sample is mixed with the eggs in a Petri dish, where the sperm will naturally penetrate the egg. The procedure is fast and within minutes, your eggs are back in the incubator and the fertilization process has begun to take place. ICSI on the other hand, uh, uh, ICSI on the other hand, takes the insemination process a little further. Here we inject a single sperm into a mature egg using a fine needle. Following the injection procedure, we return your eggs back to the incubator ICSI can only be performed on mature eggs, which can easily be spotted with the aid of a microscope. If immature eggs are injected, they will not fertilize, and it is not unusual for some of your eggs to be immature at the time of egg collection. So how do we know if your eggs are mature? The only way to evaluate or to grade your oocytes is to remove the layer of cumulus cells that surround the egg. Once this is done, the quality and degree of maturity can be assessed. Factors taken into consideration for quality and maturity assessment are the shape of the oocyte, as in if uh, are the shape of the oocyte, the color of the oocyte, as in if the egg is light or dark in appearance, the thickness of the protective shell, which is known as the zona, as well as the presence and absence of vacuoles and germinal vesicles. In the picture, there are three oocytes, uh, which have had the cumulus cells removed. The oocyte on the left, labeled A, is a germinal vesicle. Uh, and is the most immature, followed by the one labeled B, which is at the intermediate maturity known as metaphase one. And the last oocyte is at the metaphase two stage and is the most mature. It is at the metaphase two stage as an egg is ready to be injected. On the first day after the insemination, we need to find how many of your eggs have fertilized. No matter which method we have used to uh, either IVF or ICSI, the procedure for fertilization is, is the same. Um, fertilization takes place around 18 hours after we have inseminated the eggs. A normally fertilized egg should have two pronuclei, which you can see as two small circles within the egg. Uh, these are the male and female genetic material. Another sign of normal fertilization is the presence of two polar bodies, which are the byproducts of cell division that need to be released in the process so that the resulting embryo has a normal genetic content. If the egg is seen to have more or less than one, more or less than two pronuclei, then this has fertilized abnormally and is separated from the normally fertilized eggs. On day two of development, the fertilized eggs should now have formed an embryo consisting of four cells. We do not generally check the embryos on day two, as we do not want to disturb them unnecessarily. Uh, they, they are much better left alone in the incubator to develop as well as they can. The four cell embryo from day two of development should have continued developing uh, until, 
should have continued developing to form an eight cell embryo on day three. We will check this on the morning of day three, and at this point, we will grade your embryos accordingly. Depending on how the embryos have developed, we will either arrange for an embryo transfer for you the same afternoon or recommend we wait until day five. Our preference is to wait until day five, as success rates are higher when transferring day five embryos when compared to day three. It is now rare for us to recommend a day three transfer. This extension in embryo culture from day three to day five allows us to track the embryo's true potential, that is, which embryo is strong enough to reach the day five stage. Many IVF labs use their own grading system, but no matter what grading system is used, the embryos are, grade, are graded based on the evaluation of the following parameters. That is the number of cells within the embryo, the size of these cells, the appearance of the cells, and the degree or percentage of fragmentation in that embryo. A good quality embryo should have cells which are uniform in size and shape. In addition to this, fragmentation of the embryo should be at a minimum or if possible zero. On day four of development, the embryos are undergoing a very important modification process called compaction and early blastulation so that they form blastocysts. Compaction begins with the, with the embryo forming a morula. At this, stage, at this stage, the embryo usually has 16 or more cells and they start to come very close to each other and form a mass resembling a berry. Once the embryo has become comp a compacted morula, a cavity within it begins to form in a process called blastulation. The cavity fills with liquid, and as it grows, the embryo will form a blastocyst on day five or day six. Generally during day four, we do not perform any checks on the embryo, as it is difficult for us to grade the embryo with so many changes going on. We prefer to leave them undisturbed in the incubator. By day five, some of your embryos should have developed into blastocysts. They look very different to embryos of day three the cells are now starting to specialize into those that will form the baby, which are known as the inner cell mass, and those that will form the placenta, which is a trophoblast. The blastocyst will ultimately hatch from its protective shell, which has surrounded the embryo through its early development. And it's this mass of hatched cells that has the potential of implanting and forming a pregnancy. An embryo which has formed a blastocyst is at an, is at an advanced stage of development. So we know that the embryo which forms good quality blastocysts have a good have a good potential to implant. Blastocysts are graded in accordance with three parameters. The expansion of the blastocyst, the quality of the inner cell mass, and the quality of the trifecta dump. The expansion is graded numerically, one to six, with one being the least expanded and six being the most. The inner cell mass and trifecta dump are graded alphabetically, A to D, with A being the best. Once an embryo has been graded, we generally select one or two of the highest grades for transfer, and if there are any remaining good quality blastocysts after the transfer, we will freeze them so you can use them at a later stage. So to summarize, embryo development is very time specific. Embryos that divide too fast or too slow have a likely, uh, have likely abnormal gene expression and a lower implantation potential. The picture on the left is an indication of the optimal times for embryo development. And on the right, we have a time-lapse video showing a fertilized oocyte developing into a blastocyst. So this is a morula forming at this stage, and the next stage will be a, a blastocyst. So expanded blastocyst, we can see the inner cell mass in the trifecta down clearly. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prashant. That was very, very interesting. Something that we've never seen before. So I really do appreciate that. Okay, it's question and answer time. If you want to add some more questions, please now is the time to type them in. I'm going to go through them with the specialists. Um, Dr. Rodriguez, we're going to be starting with you. Good. Okay, wow. question number one. What is considered a low AMH? So by definition, they take a, a figure of, you know, about 1, 1 1.2. That's from the point of view of laboratories. Again, I'm going to go back to my story that, you know, what is a low AMH in terms of the particular patient sitting up in front of you? 
I think one has to sit with that patient and decide whether an AMH of, of 0.3 can give you a baby or not. And in my opinion, until you can't have a baby, so long as you're ovulating, you can have a baby. So, you know, we feel quite strongly about that at, at MedPim. Having said that, you've got to counsel the patient early about donor eggs. You can't go through a whole process of trying to get um, uh, a pregnancy for months on end and you've never spoken about donor eggs. So you've got to sit with them at the beginning, say these are the, these are the statistics, this is why I think it can work in you. And the one thing I found which is very important, if you find a reason why someone has hasn't fallen pregnant, such as they've got um, a severe male factor problem or they've got poor mucus or they've got really bad endometriosis. Until you give them a chance, you don't know what their egg quality is like. So there are lots of patients that we've had at very low levels uh, having their own baby, but the counseling is very important. Thank you. The next question, I'm not sure if this, Kelly, you would like to take this one or Dr. Rodriguez. Why is it that the body produces so many chromosomal abnormal embryos? Well, we can both give our own opinions, maybe, <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> well, I think that, so it's hard to know exactly why, but we know that there's so many different steps in cell division um, that need to happen, that there are so many different places where these mistakes can happen. Um, I think um, it's important to know that we see chromosomally abnormal um, embryos in young women as well as older women. So under the age of 30, you'd see about 30% of embryos being chromosomally abnormal. Um, I'm sure Dr. Rodriguez has more to add to that, but I think it just has to do with the different steps. And I'm not going to go into too, many, too much details in terms of meiosis and meiosis, but all the different places where these errors can occur. Um, so I think that often we overlook how much has to happen for there to be um, for an embryo to be um, chromosomally normal, all the different steps that it had to go through to get there. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Rodriguez has some more information to add. Yeah, um, um, I, other than the fact that the younger you are, the, the lower the chances. I mean, um, we always forget, and this is not uh, me recommending that you should have babies at 14 or 15, but that we, at 14 or 15, you by then you've gone through it full puberty and you're designed to have babies and those eggs are uh, probably the good eggs are used up earlier. No one really knows the direct answer. But I think the, the moral of the whole story is that have your babies as young as possible in a situation. If don't, don't sit and think you've got to, you know, become super wealthy. Have your babies and then the super wealth will come with them. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Dr. Rodriguez. Okay, is it, this will be for Dr. Rodriguez, is it advisable to stimulate to retrieve eggs if you have severe endometriosis and low AMH levels? So again, I think that you'll be back to the low AMH, um, AMH level. If someone has severe endometriosis and you've, and you've cleaned up that pelvis as, as best you can, or you in some, sometimes you can use medical treatment before the IVF process, there is no reason not to give someone a chance to have a baby if you've got a severe endometriosis because they haven't fallen pregnant because of that. So you've got a very good medical reason why they haven't fallen pregnant. If a woman comes to me and she's 33 and her husband's normal, her mucus is normal, her tubes are open and everything else is perfect and her AMH is low, I'm going to start to counsel her that everything's normal. So we're probably dealing with an egg quality factor as well. So that's how we run it in our practice. So counseling, um, depending on that patient and, and, and most patients are gonna opt to have it. And we've got a lot of patients who've had severe endometriosis. You get one egg from them and you create a baby with that. Thank you. And another one for you, Dr. Rodriguez. Hi doctor, with being diagnosed with, oh goodness, adenomyosis, is IVF the only way to fall pregnant? Apologies if I pronounced that incorrectly. Yeah, absolutely. So adenomyosis for the listeners is that it, it's like having endometriosis. So it's, it's the cell, the lining cells of the uterus are developing in the muscle of the uterus. So what happens, the uterus gets very big. It gets full of these cells. It can cause uh, little pockets of fluid because during the period it also bleeds in the muscle. 
And depending on the severity of adenomyosis, the big risk factor is actually not, not falling pregnant. The risk factor is poor implantation, uh, miscarriages, and very, very much so second trimester, which is from 12 to 28 weeks, miscarriages. So, but there is a but to it. You, most patients with adenomyosis will have underlying endometriosis as well. So it, you have that cleaned up and you approach the problem. And if the area around the lining of the uterus or the endometrium, if you have a good supply of three to four millimeters all the way around that, then the chances of falling pregnant are, are actually fine. Great, thank you. And another one for you. How do you feel about priming with human growth hormone or using it to using stims? So um, there are units using that and there is work in the world that suggests for, for that it might have benefit. You know, in our experience and our use of it, we didn't see the value. We have tried it, we have used it. Um, but I have no problem because I, I really do feel strongly that if you believe and trust in the doctors that, you, that you're with, they have specific treatment protocols. There are thousands of different ways of looking at things. And I think, um, you know, go with the doctor. There are definitely papers to, you, to prove it. From our point of view in the protocols we use, it's not part of our protocol. Having said that, I mean, with all my patients with low uh, um, AMH levels, I recommend that they take uh, four tablets of Staminagra every night. Uh, the reason we are uh, that was originally developed was that uh, amino acids are a, a natural stimulator of growth hormone. So there were very specific amino acids put into stamina growth to boost growth hormone. You should take it before you go to bed at night. Growth hormone works best in our dream sleep. And uh, for the right patients, that is a really good benefit in terms of low AMH levels. Thank you. And then does age play a role in men in infertility? I did an epidemi oh goodness. <laughs> they really <laughs> epididymis injection a couple of months ago, which was treated. Would this have an effect on male fertility, specifically sperm count and morphology? Um so uh, Prashan, do you want to say anything about that? Just your mic. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, uh, so recent studies have actually suggested that um, um, over 60 years old, there has, uh, there has a, um, well, there is an, uh, um, a decline in fertility in men. But I think it's, it's, it's relative uh, based on man to man, if I can say that. Take into account the, the, uh, uh, the health conditions and things like a diabetes and those type of things will definitely play a part in that. Um, with regards to the second question, uh, um, I'm just trying to understand it a bit better. I did an epididymis especially this infection. Part. Yeah, not injection. Yeah, okay. like so, so it's an infection. The epididymis. Um, the only way to tell is if you actually do a sperm analysis and see uh, what the results are. It would have been nice if we had known a sperm analysis before the infection, so we can see a pre and post infection result. And that will actually give us a better understanding. But I think you should come in for a sperm analysis and that will tell us uh, under which category you fall, if I can say that. And if I could just, just end that off, sometimes if it's really a bad infection, it can cause a, a, a blockage to the vas deferens. And, uh, but if it wasn't swelling of the testes and severe discomfort, but just a discharge, mostly with the right antibiotic, we'll get away with it. Yeah. Thank you. Kelly, this question's for you. Um, <laughs> would you like to pronounce that? Wait, let me just quickly see what the question is. Kelly, what is aneuploidy? Aneuploidy. Um, okay, so I, I hope my presentation answered that. Otherwise, um, there's a bit of a miss there. But aneuploidy means incorrect number of chromosomes. Um, so when we're talking about aneuploidy, it's anything other than the usual 46 that we would expect. Thank you. Maybe they tuned in a bit late. And Kelly, what would you consider to be an advanced maternal age? Okay, so this is traditionally considered to be from the age of 35 is where we see the risks for chromosome abnormality starting to increase. Um, 
but it's important to know that that risk doesn't spike at 35, it's a gradual increase. Um, so just to, to kind of know that, but that's, that's definitely what literature um, has shown is that we, that's where we see the increased risk of chromosome abnormalities. Thank you. And then is it recommended to conduct genetic testing on embryos from donor eggs? Um, I think that that depends on the situation. It depends on the donor. And I think it depends on discussions that um, you have with the doctor. So again, age isn't the only factor to consider um, when testing, when offering um, green plantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. So it can definitely be considered in donor situation, but I think that it, it depends on the age of the donor. There are a lot of factors to consider. So I'm not going to give a blanket yes or no answer. I think all of these things sort of need to be considered as a whole. I just, if I could just chip in there. I think that sometimes people who, who go for donor um, eggs are, are in the older age group and they're very scared of, one t of having an abnormal baby. They, they, they might be also a bit anti having terminations. So we do see requests in that group of people. They don't want to be bringing up someone, in, you know, they might be in their 40s. Now you're going to have a kid with Down syndrome who's going to be dependent on you for life. So we do see quite a big up, uh, up kick in patients who want it in, for that reason. It's more fear, fear reason. And I have no problem with that. I think it's absolutely fine. Thank you. And I was also just reminded, which is why I bent down to get the questions, that we did have some questions that came in before the webinar. So, Dr. Rodriguez, the um, ectopic, what, why does ectopic pregnancies happen in IVF? Number one, what are the chances of it happening again? And is there any way to prevent it? So, during the transfer process, normally the embryo is put about a, a centimeter, a centimeter and a half from the top of the uterus. So it gets put in the uterus. But the uterus is a very, it's a contractile organ. It, it actually contracts and it moves and it actually allows movement of the embryo up the fallopian tube. There's no question that that, that actually happens often. I mean, that's, that, there's no question about it. But then it relies on the fallopian tube to move it down. Now, often when we find these ectopics in um, patients who've had IVF, they go right to the end of the tube. They actually land up going all the way up the tube. It's a chance finding. It's about maybe one, sometimes 2% of patient, depending on patient groups that you use. And unfortunately, there's not much you can do about it other than um, placing the embryo. You know, you can't go and place the embryo lower. So it's got to be placed in the right place. Having said that, thank goodness, it's very rare. I personally haven't had an ectopic in IVF twice, um, you know, in terms of uh, a normal patient. Okay, why don't you bet IVF? Okay, so the chances of having it again is, is quite rare. As I say, I've done this for 30 years and I've never had it happen twice, but it's not impossible. Thank you, Dr. Rod. Um, somebody's asked if they can get copies of the presentations. This is being recorded. It'll be uploaded tomorrow and shared on our social media pages. Um, Dr. Rodriguez, there's also another question. In what instances would it be best to select ICSI over IVF only? So basically, as I mentioned, obviously, if there's certain male factors, you don't have a choice. Then if, you're, if, the, if, the male, if the male sperm is normal, again, we use a specific binding test, which is called Hyaluronidase HBA test. So if a patient has sperm that looks good enough for IVF, we do the HBA test. If it's abnormal, we then inject the sperm into the egg. We are of the opinion, and, and I think science shows it, that IVF is a better way of fertilizing the embryo if IVF will work because basically as much and as good as all the embryologists are, they can't actually see the normality of that sperm. It looks normal, it moves normal, and they, and they choose it by different techniques. So if, if IVF is possible, you do have the same pregnancy rate per embryo. So in other words, if you transfer an embryo, uh, you will have the same pregnancy rate. But what does happen is you tend to have a reduced number of embryos on day five. That's what we found in, in our particular practice and in the literature. So you don't have that second chance. So um, 
HBA if the sperm's fine, and then otherwise it's very specific indications for, for ICSI. Uh, just one other thing, it doesn't select, you can't go there and pick up a genetically normal sperm that looks wonderful and you know it's fine by doing ICSI. That's important to mention that. Okay, Prashan, did you want to add anything to that question? Um, I think Dr. Rodriguez actually covered everything, even the lab part of it. <laughs> okay. Then um, there's, a, there's a question for you, Prashan. Which of the techniques IVF or ICSI will give a better success? I think Dr. Rod's covered a little bit. Yeah. Give a better, better success of a good quality embryo. Yeah, I think um, that part was also covered. I mean, it's um, the only difference between IVF and ICSI is actually the insemination technique itself. So uh, it's either the, the oocyte selects which is the good uh, um, sperm that it wants, or either the embryologist selects a sperm to actually inject into an egg. And um, both actually do give you good quality embryos if you have uh, a good quality sperm to work with or good quality eggs to work with. Thank you. And then there's the question, I have a complete bicorneate uterus. Is it true that women with this uterus have a greater chance of having babies with birth defects? So no, the answer to that is no. I mean, a bicornet for the for the for the uh, audience is the a uterus that's a totally double uterus. So they have a double uterus. Some women have a single uterus with a wall in it, and that's called a septate uterus. It's got a wall in it. But these patients actually do very well. I mean, you put the embryo in one of one of you choose one of the sides, and you put the embryo in. The only thing we have to watch out for there is they have a higher risk of prematurity. So often it's recommended that we put a, a what we call a circlage or a stitch around the cervix to give it some strength during pregnancy. No, not at all. It doesn't, so it doesn't cause abnormalities. Okay, and then what impact does weight have on success of IVF, especially on patients with PCOS? So if we look at PCOS and we look at what causes it in the first place, there are two aspects of it. The first is that Often these women have very, very high egg reserve. So you'll find they have very high um, uh, AMH levels. Secondly, and especially in women who are overweight, they have insulin problems. They have, so their fasting insulins are high. The combination of the two um, will lead to a lower egg quality unless you aggressively treat the insulin, you manage the type of stimulation you're using, and usually if you aggressively treat the insulin, you will um, have a weight loss scenario. But I do believe that as a general principle for everyone listening, the better we get our lifestyles in terms of stress, diet, smoking, excess of alcohol, um, and obviously any form of drugs in terms of recreational drugs, those things need to be modified in order to get a good outcome. Thank you, Doctor. We are having a female infertility webinar on Wednesday as well. It will cover PCOS. Um, then, Dr. Rodriguez, after an ectopic pregnancy and a year of trying after the pregnancy, when should you consider IVF? Okay, so, I mean, if you've been trying for a year, that would have given you six months of, of trying because you've, you've lost one tube. And uh, really, I think the important thing there is you should, you should rather be checking on on why you're not falling pregnant. There could be other reasons, you see. So everyone just assumes if they've had an ectopic that there's something wrong with their tubes. But there could be other reasons for not falling pregnant. And then uh, it's very important before IVF in that particular patient to make sure the other tube is normal. So just to put some perspective on that, if one of your tubes is blocked or both are blocked, um, at the end of the tube, at, the, at, the, at what we call the fingers or the fimbria, and it causes this water-filled sac called the hydro, which in Latin means water, salpings means tube, so hydro salpings is a water-filled tube. That tube needs to be removed because what it does is it acts like a, a, a block drain and it pours fluid into that uterus and kills off the embryo. So I think that sort of patient needs to be worked up properly, but I think it is time to start looking and going to a fertility specialist and considering investigation and best options. Thank you. Um, then 
this person wants to know if it can be advisable to harvest the eggs and keep them for future possible future use just in case whilst looking for a partner or someone to settle down with. Yes, so I think, I think in principle, anyone who thinks about um, uh, freezing eggs should freeze them when they think about it, unless they're like my daughter who's thinking about it at 21 and I said no. But I mean, that's beside the point, you know, that's a bit young. So I think your, your issue is at the end of the day, you cannot predict what's going to happen in terms of egg numbers. And we really strongly recommend uh, uh, preservation of eggs for the right, again, for the right patient. And uh, it's, it's, a good, it's a good insurance policy, you know. Uh, what you find, a lot of people might not use those eggs, but the fact is they've got an insurance policy. Thank you. And then another one for you, Dr. Rodriguez. I've been diagnosed with unexplained infertility, two scopes done and they were normal. One failed IUI and one IVF cycle. I'm only 30 and my diagnosis comes after three years of trying. Could there be any other reason why I'm struggling to conceive? I believe we might be missing something. Yeah, look, I think, I think the important thing there, I mean, she's had a lot of investigating and they found nothing. Um, I don't know what her husband's sperm's like. We must also remember that we, we, one should check the husband, even if his sperm's normal, in terms of hormonal levels. I've had guys with, with an underactive thyroid, when you look at them, they're skinny and tall and right. Um, uh, cycles and they actually all you do is give them a cheap tablet on the male side and suddenly you've got a pregnancy so I think testing the male properly I don't know if the the fertility if she's had a mucus checked is a mucus fine in terms of natural pregnancy obviously the failed IUI IVF there are lots of reasons for it we depending on the quality of those eggs during that IVF cycle can you manage those the quality of the eggs so, you know, I must be honest, I personally, and it's not because I think there's anything specific about the way we look at things, it's very, very, very rare to find someone with no reason. I know that literature says 20%, it can't, it's not 20%. If you look right and look hard, you'll find the reason for why someone's not falling pregnant. So she might have something small that has been missed here. Thank you. And then another one for you. I have had a lap laparoscopy last month and found a severely damaged fallopian tube, which was removed as well as stage four endometriosis. When is it safe to start IVF in terms of my body healing? Yeah, so again, from our point of view, depending on the patient, we normally give them about a month of healing to six weeks. And we don't wanna leave it for too long if we're gonna do IVF. A certain group of those patients do very well with a, a course of Vizan, which is a progesterone that you take daily, and it actually inhibits it. But if they're going to be put on that, they need at least three cycles to, to get the benefit of it. Uh, there are other um, medical uh, injections that are also used by some groups. So for us, we clear up the endometriosis, not from an aggressive point of view. So there's two ways of dealing with endometriosis. The one is to just go in and for pain and to get rid of all of it. But that's, that's going to cause damage. It's going to cause damage to the ovaries. Whereas there's a fertility preserving way of doing the, the surgery. You clean up in the, any endometriomas or cysts in the ovary. You, you loosen the ovaries. You clean up around the fallopian tubes. You do what you can do. And you try and do IVF within four to six weeks of that process. I'm on mute. Thank you, Dr. Rod. Um, are chemical pregnancies due to chromosomal abnormalities? I suppose generally. You can handle that. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to pass that one over to Dr. Rodriguez. So um, I, I don't, I'm going to admit, I don't know the answer to that. I think there are lots of different reasons for chemical pregnancies, um, of which chromosome abnormalities may be one, but I don't know if Dr. Rodriguez has more information about that. Sorry, Dr. Rodriguez. No, I'm, 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 I just wanted you to have a turn there. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, a chemical pregnancy means that something went wrong with that, with that embryo early. So it, it could be sometimes related to things that have been missed if you haven't done an immunological uh, checkup. So we tend to do immune screening before we start any infertility treatment on the female. But if we've got no medical reason or 
anatomical reason for the embryo not implanting, such as a fibroid or a septum, or and on the immune side, if there's nothing wrong, such as autoimmune disease, if all of those are normal, it's generally going to be something wrong with the embryo. Uh, there is reassurance that fertilization's taken place, a certain degree of implantation's taken place. So that's not a negative. That means that things can happen. And one can go to another cycle and usually will get uh, an outcome. Obviously, recurrent biochemical pregnancies, um, we start to look at pre-genetic testing uh, to see whether it is really something wrong with the embryo in terms of chromosomes. Thank you. I think we've answered the top of pregnancy one. Um, is there a way of stimulating ovaries to see if there might be eggs in the ovaries that might be hidden? Okay, so this is obviously someone that's got maybe small ovaries and, and when someone's giving advice that it's, that it's very small, low AMH levels, again, you know, everything's about counselling for that individual patient that's in front of you. There is no fixed way of managing a person and I think that's very important. Each individual couple are, di are different to the other couple. So if someone comes and, and there's a little bit of egg reserve, you can do a a trial of stimulation. So you tell them, we're going to give you a trial of five days of, and we'll have a look. And depending on that person, the age, etc., there's nothing wrong with that. And there are patients that have asked for that and got babies out of it. And I think the thing that has taught us as fertility specialists is there are articles and papers and conferences. And to be very honest, having done this for so long, there are trends. So you've, I've heard things happen over you 10 years ago that pop up again. But at the end of the day, sit with the patient and some people need to actually go through that process and see if they can have eggs. Sometimes it's just for closure and they're happy to have that closure so that they can move on to something else. Thank you. And then is there anything one can do to improve egg quality? So there's gonna be chromosomal abnormalities in eggs you're not going to fix them. But if you get all the rest of it right, make sure that insulin, prolactin, thyroid are normal. If you make sure that lifestyle is normal, diet is normal. You, you, so, so really those things can interfere with egg quality. So you can have an egg that is, that is doing absolutely fine, but by having those out of sync, you, you actually can lead, to, can lead to not falling pregnant. For example, before glucophage was brought in, and I mean, we used it very early in women, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and we were told by the endocrinologists that we are a little bit mad, don't know what we do. But at the end of the day, it made a difference to, to what we call recurrent miscarriages. So if you continue using glucophage in the first trimester, and um, you, you actually land up having a better outcome and a better quality egg. So yes, but you can't change an abnormal edit. If it's chromosomally abnormal, it's chromosomally abnormal. Thank you. The, the PCOS questions, I think, um, can be answered in the female infertility one on Wednesday. So there's a question here, Dr. Rod. The rate of preterm birth is extremely high in ART. What are the long-term solutions to this? Well, the, the first important one is if is whether you put one or two embryos back, because a lot of that is related to multiple pregnancies. So it is a factor, and it is a factor in, in the rest of the world, and in countries where they are paying for infertility, um, they, uh, the, where, the, where the government pays for it, where it's, uh, you don't have to pay, they, you only get one embryo put back. So that's the one thing. I think the other thing is that patients are often... I think at risk because of their infertility, not because, so in other words, the reason they had infertility, um, stress plays a role, uh, is that embryo 100%, has it implanted right, is the environment right, those all play a role in determining what happens during pregnancy. Um, so I think the main one is put one embryo back and if, if they ever start paying for infertility in this country, I have no doubt whoever makes that decision will insist mostly on one embryo back at a time and keep yourselves healthy. 
and, and rest during pregnancy, you know. The days are gone where you rest during pregnancy. You're supposed to rest. You know, it's, it's not a go wild, uh, carry on working like mad. So that's the things that I would, I would recommend. Thank you. We're going to answer a couple more questions. If we don't get to your questions tonight, please feel free to email them to me at saskia at ifasa.co.za and I'll get them answered for you, no problem at all. Some of them I can see who's asked, so I can contact you directly. Otherwise, the anonymous ones, please make sure you email your questions to me so I can get them answered for you. Okay, um, let's do a couple more. Would adenomyosis have an effect on the quality of eggs? No, it won't have a direct effect. But if they've got underlying endometriosis, they often will have underlying endometriosis. There's no question in my mind or in Medfem's mind that endometriosis plays a role in the outcome. There's no question. And in the, in the recent ESHRI Congress now, which is going on, there was a, a, a paper looking at this factor and um, categorically state that stage one and two endometriosis play a role as well in infertility. So, adenomyosis, severe endometriosis, or some endometriosis, that can affect the egg. The adenomyosis doesn't affect it on its own. Thank you. And how does an increased level of insulin, pre-diabetes, play a role in fertility and influence the IVF treatment? So, the big one there is most of those patients have a tendency or they have full-blown polycystic ovaries. And at the end of the day, if you can imagine that we need the right amount of sugars going into our cells in order to, for a cell to divide. The egg is the biggest cell in the body by far, and you need, you need your, your glucose going into that cell at the same rate. People with high insulin fluctuate their blood sugars, so they will have breakfast. Two hours later, they're either going to be tired, hungry, shaky, eat some more. They're going to be carbohydrate driven. They get tired in the afternoon. Whatever's happening to their brain, which they're feeling is happening to their ovarian cell. You need those things. So that's the way it plays a role. And, and it plays a very important role and must be managed. Thank you. Okay, just a couple more. How does a low abnormal pap smear result affect IVF? Well, it, it actually doesn't. It doesn't affect it at all. Um, so the only thing is you'd want to make sure that if you've got an abnormal pap smear that you you manage it before you're pregnant, but it doesn't affect it. Okay, thank you. And this is, just, I think this will be the last question. I have had eight cycles of IUI and two chemical pregnancies. Is it advised to do genetic testing for IVF? So, yeah, you know, the thing about that is that she's, she's had two pregnancies of eight cycles. Normally what one would do there, I mean, two, Two chemical pregnancies is not usually an indication for pregenetic testing. I, I would say that she needs to have IVF and have embryos put back. And maybe, she, maybe I don't know, again, if the patient's had her immune system checked, if she's made sure that there aren't any other factors like septum, septum in the uterus, fibroids that could be causing the, the pregnancies not to implant. So I think it's more likely that IVF would be the right thing and make sure that all the basic testing has been done properly. Kelly, would you like to add anything? No, I think Dr. Rodriguez has covered it. I think it's very important to make sure that all those basic tests have been done as well because there's something going on there. But um, I think, yeah, nothing more to add. Okay, fantastic. Everybody who we didn't get to in the question and answers, please send them to me, saskia at ifasa.co.za, and we'll get them answered for you. But for now, I want to thank you all for joining us for our very first webinar during National Infertility Awareness Week, South Africa. Tomorrow, we'll be talking about male factor, including a personal story, and there are still spots available. So please go to our website, www.niaw.co.za, to register. I would like to thank Dr. Rodriguez, Kelly and Prashan for giving of your time and expertise tonight. We really, really appreciate it. And I know that it has helped, I was going to say someone out there on their journey, but I think many people out there on their journey. So thank you very much. We do appreciate it. Take care, everyone. Keep safe. And we'll post the recording tomorrow so you can rewatch this in case you missed anything. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.